Hello everyone, I'm Loth Rakana, and welcome back to Guilty Pleasures by Laurel K. Hamilton. I am going to apologize ahead of time if I misread anything or misspeak anything, please bear with me. I'm having severe tongue-tied syndrome tonight, I guess is what you'd call it, and I'm not speaking very well. So, bear with me through that, and let's get continuing with chapters 25 and 26. The woman pressed against the wall so we could pass and shut the door behind us. I kept waiting for her to lock so we couldn't get away, but she didn't. I shoved Philip's hand off my scars and he wrapped himself around my waist and led me down a long, narrow hall. The house was cool, air conditioning purring against the heat. A square archway opened into a room. It was a living room with all that implies. A couch, love seat, two chairs, plants hanging in the front of the bay window, afternoon shadows snaking across the carpeting. Homie, a man stood in the center of the room, a drink in hand. He looked like he had just come from the Leather R Us. Leather bands crisscrossed his chest and forearms, like Hollywood's idea of an oversexed gladiator. I owed Philip an apology. He dressed downright conservatively. The happy homemaker came up behind us in her royal purple lingerie and laid a hand on Philip's arm. Her fingernails were painted dark purple, almost black. The nails scratched along his arm, leaving faint reddish tracks behind. Philip shivered beside me, his arm tightening around my waist. Was this his idea of fun? I hope not. A tall black woman rose from the couch. Her rather plentiful breasts threatened to squeeze out of her black wire bra. A crimson skirt with more holes than cloth hung from the bra, sorry, shirt, and moved as she walked, giving glimpses of dark flesh. I was betting she was naked and, oh no, skirt. Betting she was naked under that skirt. There were pinkish scars on one wrist and her neck. A baby junkie, new, almost fresh. She stalked around us like we were for sale, and she wanted to get a good look. Her hand brushed my back, and I stood away from Philip, facing the woman. That scar on your back, what is it? It isn't vampire bites. Her voice was low for a woman, an alto tenor maybe. A sharp piece of wood was slammed into my back by a human servant. I didn't add that the sharp piece of wood had been one of the stakes I brought with me, or that I had killed the human servant later on that same night. My name's Rochelle, she said. Anita. The happy homemaker stepped up next to me, hands stroking over my arm. I stepped away from her, her fingers sliding over my skin. Her nails left little red lines on my arm. I resisted the urge to rub them. I was a tough-as-nails vampire slayer. Scratches didn't bother me. The look in the woman's eyes did. She looked like she wondered what flavor I was and how long I'd last. I'd never been looked, li at, looked at that way by another woman, and I didn't like it much. I'm Mage. That's my husband, Harvey, she said, pointing to Mr. Leather, who had moved to stand beside Rochelle. Welcome to our home. Philip has told us so much about you, Anita. Harvey tried to come up behind me, but I stepped back toward the couch so I could face him. They were trying to circle like sharks. Philip was staring at me, hard. Right, I was supposed to be enjoying myself, not acting like they had communicable diseases. Which was the lesser evil? A $64,000 question, if I ever had heard one. Mage licked her lips slowly, suggestively. Her eyes said she was thinking naughty things about me, and her, and no way. Rochelle sw swished her skirt, exposing far too much thigh. I had been right. She was naked under the skirt. I'd die first. That left Harvey. His small, blunt-figured hands were playing with the leather and metal studding of the little kit kilt he wore, fingers rubbing over and over the leather. Shit. I flashed him my best professional smile. Not seductive, but it was better than a frown. His eyes widened and he took a step towards me, hand reaching out towards my left arm. I took a deep breath and held it, smile freezing in place. His fingers barely traced over the bend of my arm, tickling down the skin until I shivered. Harvey took the shiver for an invitation and moved in closer, body almost touching. I put it, my hand on his chest to keep him from coming any closer. The hair on his chest was coarse and thick, black. I'd never been a fan of hairy chests. Give me a smooth any day. 
His arm began to encircle my back. I wasn't sure what to do. If I took a step back, I was going to sit down on the couch. Not a good idea. If I stepped forward, I'd expect stepping into him, pressed against all that leather and skin. He smiled at me. I've been dying to meet you. He said dying like it was a dirty word or an inside joke. The others laughed, all except Philip. He took my arm and pulled me away from Harvey. I leaned into Philip, even put my arms around his waist. I'd never hugged anyone in a fishnet shirt before. It was an interesting cessation. Philip said, remember what I said? Sure, sure, Midge said. She's all yours, all yours, no sharing, no halfsies. She stalked over to him, swaying in her tight lace panties, with heels on so she could look him in the eye. You can keep her safe from us for now, but when the big boys get here, you'll share. They'll make sure you share. He s stared at her until she looked away. I brought her here, and I'll take her home, he said. Mage raised an eyebrow. You're going to fight them? Philip, my boy, she must be a sweet piece of tail, but no bed warmer is worth pissing off the big guys. I stepped away from Philip and put a hand flat on her stomach and pushed, just enough to make her back up. The heels made her balance bad and she almost fell. Let's get something straight, I said. I'm not a piece of anything, nor am I a bed warmer. Philip said, Anita, my, my, she's got a temper. "'Wherever did you find her, Philip?' Mage asked. "'If there is anything I hate, it's being found amusing when I'm angry.' I stepped up close to her, and she smiled down at me. "'Did you know,' I said, "'that when you smile, you get deep wrinkles on either side of your mouth? "'You're over forty, aren't you?' She drew a deep, gasping breath and stepped back from me. "'You little bitch!' "'Don't ever call me a piece of tail again, Mage, darling.' Rochelle was laughing, silently, her considerable bosom shaking like dark brown jello. Harvey stood straight-faced. If he had ever so much as smiled, I think Mage would have heard him. His eyes were very shiny, but there was never a hint of a smile. A door opened and closed down the hall farther into the house. A woman stepped into the room. She was around fifty, or maybe a hard forty. Very blonde hair framed a plump face. Even money... blonde came out of a bottle. Even money, the blonde came out of a bottle. Plump little hands glittered with rings, real stones. A long uh, black negligee, negligee swept the floor, complete with an open lace robe. The flat black of the negligee was kind of to her figure, but not kind enough. She was overweight, and there was no hiding it. She looked like a PTA member, a Girl Scout leader, a cookie baker, someone's mother, and here she stood in the store doorway, staring at Philip. She let out a little squeal and came running towards him. I got out of the way before I was crushed in the stampede. Philip had just enough time to brace himself before she flung her considerable weight in his arms. For a minute, I thought it was going to fall under the floor, with her on top, but his back straightened, his legs tensed, and he righted them both. Strong Philip, able to lift overweight nymphomaniacs, with both hands. Harvey said, This is Crystal. Crystal was kissing Philip's chest, chubby, homey little hands trying to pull off his shirt out of his pants so she could touch his bare flesh. She was like a cheerful little puppy in heat. Philip was trying to discourage her without much success. He gave me a long glance, and I remembered what he'd said. They had stopped coming to these parties. Was this why? Crystal and her like? Mage of the sharp fingernails? And I had forced him to bring me. But in doing so, I had forced him to bring himself. If you thought of it that way, it was my fault Philip was here. Damn, I owed him. I patted the woman's cheek softly. She blinked at me, and I wondered if she was nearsighted. Crystal, I said, and smiled my best angelic smile. Crystal, I don't mean to be rude, but you're pawing my date. Her mouth fell open. Her pale eyes bugged me out. Date? She squeaked, no one has dates at a party. Well, I'm new to these parties. I don't know the rules yet, but where I come from, one woman does not grope another woman's date. At least wait until I turn my back, okay? Crystal's lower lip trembled. Her eyes began to fill with tears. I'd been gentle, kind even, and she still was going to cry. What was she doing here with these people? Mage came and put her arm around Crystal and led the woman away. Mage was making smooth noises and patting her black silken arms. Rochelle said, very cold. She walked away from me, toward the liquor cabinet that was against one wall. 
Harvey had also left, following Mage and Crystal without so much as backwards glance. You'd think I'd kicked a puppy. Philip let out a long breath and sat down on the couch. He clasped his hands in front of him, between his knees. I sat down next to him, tucking my shirt down over my legs. I don't think I can do this, he whispered. I touched his arm. He was trembling, a constant shaking that I didn't like at all. I hadn't realized what it would cost him to come tonight, but I was beginning to find out. We can go, I said. He turned to me very slowly and stared at me. What do you mean? I mean we can go. You leave now without finding out anything because I'm having problems? He asked. Let's just say I like you better as the overconfident flirt. You keep acting like a real person. You'll have me all confused. We can go if you can't handle it. He took a deep breath and let it out, then shook himself like a dog coming out of water. I can do it. If I have a choice, I can do it. It was my turn to stare. Why didn't you have a choice before? He looked away. I just felt like I had to bring you if you wanted to come. T no, damn it. That wasn't what you meant at all. I touched his face and forced him to look at me. Somebody gave you orders to come see me the other day, didn't they? It wasn't just to find out about Jean-Claude, was it? His eyes were wide. I could feel his pulse under my fingers. What are you afraid of, Philip? Who's giving you orders? Anita, please, I can't. His hand dropped to my lap. What are your orders, Philip? He swallowed and I watched his throat work. I'm to keep you safe here, that's all. His pulse was jumping under the bruised bite in my neck, in his neck. His li he licked his lips, not seductive, but nervous. He was lying to me. The trick was, how much of a lie, and what about? I heard Major's voice coming up the hall, all cheers of cheerful and seduction. She made a good hostess. She escorted two people into the room, one a woman with short auburn hair and too much eye makeup like green chalk smeared above her eyes. The second was Edward, smiling at his charming best, with his arm around Major's bare waist. She gave a rich, throaty laugh as he whispered something to her. I froze for a second. It was so unexpected that I just froze. If he had pulled out a gun, he could have killed me while I sat here with my mouth hanging open. What the hell was he doing here? Mage led him and the woman toward the bar. He glanced back at me and over her, sh over her shoulder and he gave me a delicate smile that left blue eyes empty as a doll's. I knew my 24 hours were not up. I knew that. Edward had decided to come looking for Nicholas. Had he followed us? Had he listened to Philip's message in my machine? What's wrong? Philip asked. What's wrong? I said you're taking orders from somebody, probably a vampire. I finished the statement silently in my head. And Death has just waltzed into the door to play freak while he searches for Nicolaus. It was only one reason Edward searched for a particular vampire. He meant to kill her if he could. <sighs> the assassin might have finally met his match. I had thought I wanted to be around when Edward finally lost. I wanted to see what prey was too large for Death to conquer. I had seen this prey up close and personal. If Edward and Nicolaus met, and she even suspected that I had handed it, shit. Shit, shit, shit! I turned it. I should turn Edward in. He had threatened me, and he would carry it out. He would torture me to get information. What did I owe him? But I couldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. A human being does not turn another human being over to the monsters. Not for any reason. Monica had broken that rule, and I despised her for it. I think I was the closest thing Edward had to a real friend. A person who knows who and what you are and likes you anyway. I did like him, despite or because of what he was, even though I knew he'd kill me if it worked out that way. Yes, even though. It didn't make much sense when you looked at it that way, but I would, couldn't worry about Edward's morality. The only person I had to face in the mirror was me. The only moral dilemma I could solve was my own. I watched Edward play kissy face with Mage. He was much better at role-playing than I was. He was also a much better liar. I would not tell, and Edward had known I would not tell. In his own way, he knew me too. He had bet his life on my integrity, and that pissed me off. I hate to be used. My virtue had become my own punishment. But maybe I didn't know how yet. I could use Edward in the way he was using me. Perhaps I could use his lack of honor as my... As he used my honor now. It had possibilities. Chapter 26 The auburn hair woman with Edward came over to the couch and slid into Philip's lap. She giggled and wrapped her arms around his neck with a little kick of her feet. Her hands didn't wander, and she didn't try to undress him. The night was looking up. Edward followed behind the woman like a blonde shadow. There was a drink in his hand and a suitably harmless smile on his face. If 
If I hadn't known him, I would have never looked at him and said, There, there is a dangerous man, Edward the Chameleon. He balanced on the couch arm at the woman's back, one hand rubbing her shoulder. Anita, this is Darlene, Philip said. I nodded. She giggled and kicked her little feet. This is Teddy. Isn't he scrumptious? Teddy? Scrumptious? I managed to smile and Edward kissed the side of her cheek. She snuggled against his chest, managed to wiggle in Philip's lap at the same time. Coordination. Let me. Let me have a taste. Darlene sucked her lower lip under her teeth and drew it in. Drew it out slowly. Philip's breath trembled. He whispered, Yes. I didn't think I was going to like this. Darlene cupped his arm in her hands and raised it to her mouth. She bestowed a delicate kiss over one of his scars. Then she slid her legs down between his until she was kneeling at his feet, still holding his arm. The full skirt of her dress was bunched up around her waist, caught on his legs. She was wearing red lace panties and matching garters. Color coordination. Philip's face had gone slack. He was staring at her as she brought his arm towards her mouth. A small, pink tongue licked his arm. Quick out, quick out, wet gone. She glanced at Philip, eyes dark and full. She must have liked what she saw because she began to lick his scars one by one. Delicate, a cat with cream. Her eyes never left his face. Philip shuddered, his spine spasmed. He closed his eyes and leaned his head back against the couch. Her hands went to his stomach. She gripped the fishnet and pulled. It slid out of his pants and her eyes, hands stroked up his bare chest. He jerked, eyes wide and caught her arms. He shook his head. No, no. His voice sounded hoarse, too deep. You want me to stop? Darlene asked. Her eyes were nearly closed, breath deep, lips full and waiting. He was struggling to talk and make sense at the same time. If we do this, that leaves Anita alone. Fair game. Her first party. Darlene looked at me. Maybe for the first time. With scars like that? Scars are from a real attack. I talked her into the party. He brought her hands out from under his, his shirt. I can't desert her. His eyes seemed to be focused again. She doesn't know the rules. Darlene leaned her head on his thigh. Philip, please, I've missed you. You know what they do to her. Teddy will keep her safe. He knows the rules. I asked, you've been to other parties? Yes, Edward said. He held my gaze for several seconds while I tried to picture him at other parties. So this is where he got his information about the vampire world. Through the freaks. No, Philip said. He stood, bringing Darlene to her feet, still holding her forearms. No, he said, and his voice sounded certain, confident. He released her and held out his hand to me. I took it. What else could I do? His hand was sweating and warm. He strode out of the room, and I was forced to half run in my heels to catch up with my hand. He led me down the hall to the bathroom, and we went in. He locked the door and leaned against it. Sweat beaded on his face, eyes closed. I took the back of my hand, and he t didn't fight me. I looked around at the available seating and finally chose to sit on the edge of the bathtub. It wasn't comfortable, but it seemed the lesser of two evils. Philip drew in great gulps of air and finally returned to the sink. He ran water loud and splashing, dipped his hands in, and covered his face again and again until he stood, water dripping down his face. Droplets caught in his eyelashes and hair. He blinked at himself in the mirror over the basin. He looked startled, wide-eyed. The water was dripping down his neck and chest. I stood and handed him a towel from the rack. He didn't respond. I mopped up his chest with the soft, clean-smelling folds of the towel. He finally took the towel and finished drying off. His hair was dark and wet around his face. There was no way to dry it out. I did it, he said. Yes, I said, you did it. I almost let her. But you didn't, Philip. That's what counts. He nodded rapidly, head bobbing. I guess so. He still seemed out of breath. We better be getting back to the party. He nodded, but he stayed where he was, breathing too deep like he couldn't get enough oxygen. Philip, are you all right? It was a stupid question, but I couldn't think of anything else to say. He nodded. Mr. Conversation. Do you want to leave? I asked. He looked at me then. That's the second time you've offered that. Why? Why what? Why would you offer to let me out of my promise? I shrugged and rubbed my hands over my arms. Because... Because you seem to be in some kind of pain. Because you're a junkie that's trying to kick the habit, sort of, and I don't want to screw that up for you. <clears throat> that's a very decent thing to offer. He said decent like he wasn't used to the word. Do you want to leave? Yes, he said, but we can't. He said that before. Why can't we? I can't, Anita. I can't. 
Yes, you can. Who are you taking orders from, Philip? Tell me. What's going on? I was standing, nearly touching him, spitting each word into his chest, looking up at his face. It is always hard to be tough when you have to look up to see someone's eyes. But I've been short all my life, and practice makes perfect. His hands slid around my shoulders. I pushed away from him, and his hands locked behind my back. Philip, stop it. I had my hands flat on his chest to keep our bodies from pressing together. His shirt was wet and cold, his heart hammering in his chest. I swallowed hard and said, your shirt's wet. He released me so suddenly, I stumbled back from him. He drew the shirt over his head in one fluid motion. Of course he'd had a lot of practice in undressing himself. It would have been such a nice chest without the scars. He took one step toward me. Stop right where you are, I said. What's this sudden change of mood? I like you, isn't that enough? I shook my head. No, it isn't. He dropped the shirt to the floor. I watched it fall like it was important. Two steps, and he was beside me. Bathrooms are so small. I did the only thing I could think of. I stepped into the bathtub. Not very dignified in high heels, but I wasn't pressed up against Philip's chest. Anything was an improvement. Somebody is watching us, he said. I turned slowly like a bad horror movie. Twilight hung against the sheer drapes, and a face peered out from the coming dark. It was Mr. Harvey. Mr. Leather. The windows were too high for him or to be standing on the ground. Or was he standing on a box? Or maybe they had little platforms at all the windows so you could watch the show. I let Philip help me out of the bathtub, and I whispered, Could he hear us? Philip shook his head. His arms slid around my back again. We're supposed to be lovers. Do you want Harvey to stop believing that? This is blackmail. He smiled, dazzling. Hold it in your hand and stroke it, sexy. My stomach tightened. He bent down, and I didn't stop him. The kiss was everything. Advertised. Full soft lips, oppressive skin, a heated weight. His hands tightened across my bare back, fingers kneading the muscles along the spine until I relaxed against him. He kissed the lobe of my ear, breath warm, tongue flicked along the edge of my jaw. His mouth found the pulse in my throat, his tongue searching for it as if he were melting through the skin. Teeth scraped over the beating of my neck, teeth clamped down, tight, hurting. I shoved him back away. Shit, you bit me! His eyes were unfocused, dazed. A crimson drop stained his lower lip. I touched a hand to my neck and came away with blood. Damn you! He licked my blood off his mouth. I think Harvey believes the performance. Now you're marked. You got the proof of what you are and why you came. He took a deep, shaking breath. I won't have to touch you again tonight. I'll see that no one else does either, I swear. My neck was throbbing. A bite. A freaking bite. Do you know how many germs are in the human mouth? He stout, smiled at me, a little unfocused. No, he said. I shoved him out of the way and dabbed water on the cut. It looked like it was. Human teeth. It wasn't a perfect set of bite marks, but it was close. Damn you! We need to go out so you can hunt for clues. He had picked up a shirt from the floor and stood there, holding it at his side. Bare tanned chest, leather pants, full lips full like he'd been sucking on something. Me. You look like an ad for rent a gigolo, I said. He shrugged. Ready to go out? I was still touching the wound. I tried to be angry and couldn't. I was scared, scared of Philip and what he was or wasn't. I hadn't expected it. Was he right? Would I be safe for the rest of the night, or had he just wanted to see what I tasted like? He opened the door and waited for me. I went out. As we walked back to the living room, I realized Philip had distracted me from my questions. Who is he looking for? Working for? I still didn't know. It was damn embarrassing that every time he took off his shirt, my brain went out to lunch. But no more. I'd had my first and last kiss from Philip of the many scars. From now on... I would remain the tough-as-nails vampire slayer, not to be distracted by rippling muscles or nice eyes. My fingers touched the bite mark. It hurt. No more Mrs. Nice Guy. If Philip came near me again, I was going to hurt him. Of course, knowing Philip, he'd probably enjoy it. And that, my friends, was the end of Chapter 26. I do hope you enjoyed the video. Or the reading. If you did, hit that like button. If this happens to be the first video you've seen by me... Or, if you've been tuning in and have not yet subscribed, go ahead and subscribe and hit that little notification bell so you know when I put a video out. I want to thank you all for watching, and have a wonderful evening.